Hi and welcome back to another TechMinds video. Now this is going to be part one of a series of videos where I build a 250 watt RF amplifier for a frequency of 2.4 gigahertz. Now before we get into the video, I must warn you that this can be extremely dangerous. Never run a high power 2.4 gigahertz amplifier without it being shielded. The RF at 2.4 gigahertz with this much power and permanently cause damage to your eyes or other parts of your body. Now always do your research before attempting any of what's shown in this video series. Right, on with the video. Now the main component in this video will be an E-Reon PowerBlast 300, which can deliver more than 250 watts over the 100 MHz bandwidth of ISM 2.45. The amp accepts a nominal 22 dBm or 160 mW RF input, and will provide a 33 dB of gain from 2.4 to 2.5 GHz. It also uses the latest and more mature LDMOS technology. Now this particular amplifier can be used in a wide range of applications, such as plasma generation, telecom links, and even act as a cooking driver. However, the end goal will be to create an amplifier, which I can use as a 2.4 GHz uplink for digital amateur television, on the QO100 satellite. Now, of course, you can also use this as a primary amplifier on the 13 centimeter handbands if you're licensed. Now, minimum voltage required will be 28 volts with a maximum of 32. However, I'll be running this amp from 28 volts as that's what my power supply provides. Maximum current draw when really pushing this amp will be just 18 amps. So make sure your power supply can cope with this. Now using 28 volts at P1dB will draw around 16 amps according to the specifications. Now as standard, the RF input is via an SMA connector and the output is via an N-type female. You will notice that the PCB is mounted on a solid piece of aluminium. However, directly under the main RF device, there is a solid lump of copper to help transfer heat through to the aluminium plate. As this amplifier could potentially run extremely hot, then extra cooling is needed. And to do this, I'll be bolting it to a large heatsink. Now I've decided to use a Hammond 1550J diecast aluminium box to house the amplifier. The box measures 275 by 175 by 67 millimeters for those that are interested. Now this should provide ample space to mount the amplifier in and also provide enough space to fit things like status LEDs and switches along with power terminals. The heat sink that I'm going to use will be this one, which measures 250 by 125 with 50 mm cooling fins. Now I did buy a bigger heat sink which was larger than the box, but I had real trouble cutting it to size, so I went with this one. Now cooling is going to be a major factor with this project and I will most likely try a few different methods, but more about that in a moment. As the amplifier could potentially draw up to 18 amps at 28 volts, I decided to use some heavy duty power terminals through the side of the box. Now fitting these are fairly easy and they're relatively cheap to purchase like from eBay or Amazon. Also having connectors coming through the sidewalls means there should not be any part of the amplifier exposed to the outside world, which could potentially cause damage to yourself or anyone near the amp when it's in use. So this is how far I've got with the build. I've cut a hole in the bottom of the Hammond box, which is actually going to be the top, and then I've bolted the heatsink through the box. Now you may notice that the two holes in the middle appear to have something stuck in them. Well, this is my first two mistakes with this build. Even after drilling pilot holes in the aluminium heatsink, I managed to snap two separate tapping drill bits. At the moment, they're still in there, but I will need to look at a way to remove them soon. I've also mounted two LEDs on what will be the front panel. The left green LED will be used to indicate that there's power coming into the amplifier box. The blue LED on the right will have a toggle switch fitted nearby, which will be used to enable or disable that amplifier using the enable pin on the PCB. Now, as you saw earlier, I've mounted the power terminals, which will bring in the 28 volts from the power supply neatly into the box, which will then be wired directly to the amplifier. 
Other items like N-type sockets for RF input and output has yet to be fitted and that's because I'm waiting for another piece of important equipment to arrive and at this point I'm not sure if I'm going to fit it inside or outside the box. More about this in the next video but if you want a slight hint, Google circulators. The pallet will be bolted to the underside of the heatsink like this. I will of course be using thermal paste between the pallet's aluminium case and the heatsink to help transfer heat. Now you may notice something different about the pallet from when I showed it to you earlier and that's the output connector. Now I've changed this from the N-Type to an SMA panel socket. Don't worry, I've made sure that the specification for this panel socket can withstand the power I'm going to use through it. What is important though is if you plan to change the connector is to make sure there's no leftover flux around the connector or PCB tracks. At this kind of power that I want to use and the frequency, any leftover dried flux will start to heat up and potentially burn the PCB. So always make sure it's nice and clean. For those of you that noticed the drilling marks on the underside of the aluminium block, don't worry, it's perfectly flat. This is important because we want a perfectly flat surface between this underside and the heatsink. Any bumps or dents would lower its heat transfer efficiency. Now before I fit this permanently, I will be cleaning the heatsink and the block before applying the thermal paste, which I'll show you the process in the next video. When it comes to keeping the amplifier cool while it's running, it's going to take some tests. The first test I'll perform will be by using these server fans. In fact, I'll be using three of them mounted at the end to blow through the fins. Now, until I have the temperature sensor installed and actually testing the amplifier, I will not be 100% sure if this method will work well. However, I can safely say that these things do blow out some air. Anyway guys, that's the end of part one of this video series. If you'd like to follow me on my journey of building this 2.4 GHz amplifier, then make sure to be subscribed so you're notified of when I upload a video. Until the next video, stay safe, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.